Well, to put it in perspective, only 10% of Canadians will die an instant death. That means they will have the heart attack, the stroke that kills them. 90% of Canadians will die from chronic diseases. It could be cancer, it could be COPD, it could be Alzheimer's, any number of chronic diseases in which the trajectory for death will not be instant. And those people need special care at the end of their lives. And that special care is palliative care. Many people tend to think of palliative care is about dying. I think it's about living. And I think it's about living well until the very end. That means living as pain-free as possible. That means by being supported by a community, a community of, yes, the medical community, the doctors, the nurses, the home care people, but more importantly, a community of friends and neighbors and families working together to ensure that this person leaves this life in a positive way, that they have told those they care about that they love them, that their loved ones have told them they love them, so that you have a, a sense of departure, but also a sense of well-being, that this person has died well. That's palliative care to me, and I think it should be the right of every single Canadian. I began my interest in palliative care with the death of my mother. My mother had been a caregiver for 10 years. My father was a stroke victim. He was told that he should remain in hospital, he'll have other strokes, and that will be the end of his life. My mother, after two months, said, Harold, you can sit in that bed and vegetate, or you can come home and get better. She took him home and she got him better. She got him speaking again. She uh, had him, with help, uh, have physiotherapy. What the physiotherapists never understood was that he didn't get physiotherapy three times a week. He got it seven days a week because she learned all the exercises and she gave them to him. And so he made remarkable progress. When he died 10 years later, it was a good death. He'd had 10 years we didn't expect him to have. But then when we looked at my mother, we realized she was very ill. And that's a very common caregiver story that they literally give so much to the person they're caring for, they have nothing left for themselves. She came to live with me in Winnipeg at the end of her life. And when she said that she wanted to go to hospital, we took her to hospital. And she asked for and signed a do not resuscitate order. She had a cardiac arrest, they resuscitated her. And I was furious because her rights, as she had indicated them, should have been protected, and they weren't. So that started me on a journey, but it was only when I was appointed to the Senate in 1994 that I found the opportunity to put into action many of the thoughts that I had been thinking over a great number of years. 5% of Canadians were getting palliative care in 1995. We probably have gone from 5 to 30, maybe 35% of people now getting palliative care, although it varies from place to place because of inadequate funding. But to me, that isn't a win. We still have 70% to go. And it's that 70% that we need to concentrate on. Canadians should have 100% access to the care that they need at the end of their lives. And to this day, we still don't have a national strategy on palliative care. But I have great faith in Canadians. I know that they want to reach out to other human beings in times of need, but they don't know how. They don't know what resources would help. You know, sometimes it can be as simple as I hear your mother's not doing very well. Could I take over your snow shoveling for a couple of weeks? Could I bring you some dinner on Thursday night? If I'm part of your faith group, could we come and, and spend some quality spiritual time with your mother? Whatever works to make that family more comfortable and to ease the burden on the caregiver 
is what should be accomplished by a compassionate community. Compassionate communities is, is a concept that says that a person should not die alone. A person should die as part of a community. And we know that only about 10% of that person's daily activities will be taken care of by a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist or whatever. But what about the other 90%? The Sandwich Generation is caught. They are driven between care for their parents, care for their children, the ability to progress in their own work environment so they have the money to quite frankly care for both the parents and for the children. They are often caught in intolerable situations. Something has to give. When I tried to uh, present to the cabinet committee the aspect of how we could use employment insurance benefits for a compassionate leave for people who wanted to care for their uh, dying loved ones. I was sitting around a table with a number of ministers, all of whom had their own agenda. They were all presenting at that meeting, all trying to get funding from the federal government. And I knew I had to grab their attention. So I said, you're all going to die. I can assure you every table, uh, every face went up from the table. And then I said, and now I want to talk about how you want to do it. We got the benefit. We didn't get what we wanted. We went in asking for 10 weeks. We ended up with six, uh, but that was the foot in the door. And now of course it has been broadened and broadened and broadened. And now it's up to a year uh, in benefits that someone can take. But that only works again if the community gets together because EI benefits in and of themselves are not adequate to live on. They have done it for maternity leave. Well, if you can understand the importance of providing support to a new mother and a new baby and the new father, it's wonderful. It's a sign of who we are as Canadians. Why can't we do the same thing? when someone is dying. Surely that also is a sign of our humanity, of what we mean to one another. What we cannot lose sight of is that this person is an individual with their wants, their desires, their needs, till the very end. It's, it, we are a death-denying society, so as soon as somebody says, oh, they're dying, we seem to flee in, in so many directions, when that's exactly the time we need to come together to support that individual in a trajectory that may be months, it may be even years. Because someone is dying, it doesn't mean it's happening tomorrow. And they need our love, they need our support. Making people aware of the dying experience cannot be focused only on seniors. It's not just a post-65 condition. It can happen at any time. And while we remain a death-denying society, we tend to lose that focus. If we can educate everyone that dying is a natural part of life, we can arm them with some supports. We can make their community aware through organizations like Pallium and through compassionate communities that they will need your support and help. You need to be there for them. And by the way, this is the kind of thing you can do. It's not just a matter of saying to people, you need to be there. It's a means of saying to them, these are the practical things that in your community you can do to make the dying experience better. I have given a number of presentations now in which people come up afterwards and say, well, I could do that, but I don't know how to do that. And that's the next step, is trying to teach people how they could do it. Trying to get everything from schools to universities to community clubs to faith groups all engaged in saying, this is our job. This is part of what we are, this is part of what we do.